Good afternoon, and welcome to our Women in the Workplace uh, discussion for Women's History Month. Uh, my name is uh, Ashlyn Lewis. Um, I'm a journeyman blacksmith in the Anderson Blacksmith Shop here at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, I've been with the foundation for 10 years, uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, the rest of uh, my colleagues here with me here from Trades today. Hi, I'm Jenny Lynn. I'm an apprentice tinsmith at the Anderson Armory. Um, I've worked for Colonial Williamsburg for 12 years. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma Cross, and I am an apprentice artificer here in the Public Leather Works, which is producing military supply in the way of leather goods uh, during the American War for Independence. And I'm Lindsay Lesbicar, Master Engraver here at Colonial Williamsburg, and I've been here um, just about 25 years now. Wonderful. So we'll all be discussing various research that we've come across um, as we've studied women um, in the workplace throughout all of our respective trades, but also um, ones that we've just kind of come across in passing that were particularly uh, of interest. But uh, to kick us off, um, we'd like to start by showing you um, a clip that uh, we filmed uh, in Lynn's shop. <laughs> Women are training apprentices in these workplaces is pretty commonplace. I mean, whether it's a daughter, whether it's enslaved children, and here we've got a couple of young girls learning how to do some engraving cutting, kind of how to look at those objects, get used to those tools, and, you know, get into good practice with those uh, apprentice skills. And here she's doing a little bit of cutting with an engraving tool. And it's, you know, building a relationship just like a mother and daughter. It could be, um, you know, a woman working with a child that's not her own. And again, you know, learning how to work with those tools. Here the girls are doing a little bit of filing and um, getting used to doing a little prep work for copper. So maybe not the higher skilled part of um, apprenticeship work, but something that's going to be a constant part of that apprenticeship. And of course, they're building relationships too, whether it's uh, apprentices or again, enslaved folks on that property. So there we had um, a great video of a couple of young girls on the Getty property um, doing some practice work with engraving, very typical apprenticeship work, doing some drawing, getting started with the tools and chores around the shop. I mean, that's gonna be a constant part whether you're um, apprentice or enslaved or you know other children on site, that's going to be uh, a major responsibility to keep things going. You got to start somewhere. Right? You got to start somewhere. You got it. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think that's a you know an element of 18th century life that's inescapable. There's children all over mm -hmm. the place, um, and it's not just in your home; it's in your workplace because very often mm -hmm. those are one and the same. So they're going to have to not only be learning things that they can do throughout the day, but you know, also be taken care of if they're not of an age to be yeah. being taught to work actively. You know, the Getty family, there was eight of them. There was eight kids all together, um, not including the enslaved folks on the property, which was quite a few working in the home as well as working in the foundry. And that's the whole idea of apprenticeship to, to begin mm -hmm. with, I think, is that you are learning skills to then provide for yourself mm -hmm. a trade that will provide for your future and potentially even others' futures as well. So when we talk about apprenticeship and how women specifically learned the trade, you know, we can use that term, but sometimes it wasn't a formal apprenticeship. Sometimes it's like, hey, will you teach, mm -hmm. you know, my your niece how to, mm -hmm. to do this so that 
she'll have something to provide for herself or your daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so I think sometimes we see a lack of documentation, wouldn't you agree, uh, about women's um, apprenticeships, if you will? Well, mm -hmm. and especially when it's family related. Yeah. Because absolutely. you have that family connection of needing to be in the shop. You, if you don't have the money to pay a journeyman, you bring your family members in, whether it's your daughters, your sons, anybody who's able to do the work, you bring them in. Yeah. Right. And an apprenticeship document is a way of creating legal framework for people who are not in a, a natural arrangement of, of care. Yeah. So if it's in your family and you're already responsible for a child, then having paperwork for it may or may not be considered as important. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, apprenticeships are a great way to foster in the 18th century. We use that modern word, but you find girls apprenticing at what, I think I remember one, at the age of three. Now, obviously, they're not going to be learning any trade at the age of three, but they're being taken care of until they're old enough to learn that trade. Right. So you see that happening in the 18th century and as well. Specifically, a woman named Betsy Hager, who's up in New England, she's um, apprenticed quite young uh, to a blacksmith, and she grows up in that work and then is recorded later um, during some of the engagements during the Revolutionary War doing repair work um, on some of the equipment um, that was broken. So she's clearly continued with that trade into adulthood. Yeah. And then I'm sure there were also, I'm sure there were girls who had that formal contract between a master or a mistress of a shop and that may just not survive through the, the records of history, unfortunately, <laughs> as much as we all might like it to. And I don't think we're going to see as much of that here in the colonies as in Europe. I right. mean, in England, yeah. we know of um, some women even apprenticing their daughters and watching clock making or even case making very specific trades. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's, a, I think, a neat segue into the fact that women's work is both administrative and physical. You know, there's both sides of that coin in any business. I mean, women are involved in, in both paths. Um, and we do have a, a clip to uh, illustrate that element of the work. William Hutton in 1741 writes, the art of nail making is one of the most ancient among us. We may safely charge its antiquity with four figures. The manufacturers are so scattered round the country that we cannot travel far in any direction out of the sound of the nail hammer. But Birmingham, like a powerful magnet, draws the produce of the anvil to herself. When I first approached her from Walsall in 1741, I was surprised at the prodigious number of blacksmith shops upon the road, and could not conceive how a country, though populous, could support so many people of the same occupation. In some of these shops I observed one or more females, wielding the hammer with all the grace of their sex. The beauties of their face were rather eclipsed by the smut of the anvil. Struck with the novelty, I inquired whether the ladies in this country shod horses, but was answered with a smile, they are nailers. So as you can see in that clip, um, that's some, some nail making that um, I was doing in our shop here in, um, in Colonial Williamsburg, but nail making was a, a very um, prevalent trade in England, um, and there's a huge number of women involved um, in that trade uh, specifically. Um, it's what would have been considered light work, um, which is maybe perhaps slightly differently understood in the 18th century than it is today. Uh, but there's a lot of women um, and young people involved in that trade as well as men. So um, the quote that was um, being um, overlaid there is, is really just a, a traveler going through that part of England and commenting on, on what he sees and what that, that daily activity um, would have looked like. Um, and nail making and a number of other smaller trades, um, chain making, um, some of the ones that Lynn mentioned, um, those are jobs that you can, you can do close to your home. You know, mm -hmm. They don't require large um, equipment setups and things like that. You can kind of tuck them away and have them uh, accessible uh, when you're balancing your, your home and your work. Absolutely. But I think this also highlights the point that women were actively participating in a ton of different trades, whether they're male-dominated or female-dominated. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and obviously, as you mentioned, there's a difference between Europe and Virginia and the, the amount of women that you see here in Virginia in business and in trade, but there's still a lot, yeah. um, especially here even just in Williamsburg. I think, what, it's like 30% of the businesses are owned by women and are operated by women in some way, which is a lot. So it's not a very big town. Yeah. 
Um, so that active physical labor is super important to, to all of that trade. Absolutely. You were mentioning about Mrs. Getty when she takes over for her husband. Yeah, when Ann Getty takes over the business, she's pregnant with her eighth child. So yeah, she's, she's got her hands full to begin with, let alone, you know, kind of overseeing that business and making sure it continues forward yeah. until the boys are old enough to take over. Yeah. You know, so well, it's a lot going on. And I think that's a really important thing to, to remember is that women in the workplace, they're, they're having to do the work but do it successfully and yes. do it yeah. successfully immediately mm -hmm. uh, because their family and their survival, their ability to feed and clothe themselves is dependent on that. You don't have right. the sort of support structure or safety nets that we tend to think of today. Um, you do see the church in that aspect in some cases, right. but um, it, it really is a very, uh, could be a very stressful situation. Um, yeah. But they need to understand how to jump right in and have it be, yeah. be successful. Well, and you also see a lot more women participating in more industrialized work. So if you have um, industrialized nations like Britain needing lots of factory workers or people working in the background, um, you have the women doing kind of the in-between half-skilled or unskilled work, uh, not quite to the level of a master or a journeyman, but somebody who can step in and polish something. So we have a great image from Diderot, uh, which is actually an image of a French tin plating factory, where you can see some women in the back polishing the plates. Um, so they're all lined up there, they're all wearing their gowns, but the men are doing the, the dipping in the center at the big chimney but it's the women doing the finishing work. Yeah. And that, that lasts in Britain all the way up through the 1950s. We have photographs of women there wow. into the 20th century still doing that type of labor. Oh, wow. And you see that with chain making as well. There's some amazing imagery mm -hmm. of, of women in these chain making shops surrounded by literally heaps of chain up, yeah. up to their, past their knees. Wow. Yeah. We'll yeah. see them in the 19th century in silversmithing, goldsmithing work, where a lot of it's finisher, finishers or chasers or engravers. Yeah. You know. But also part of that too, women are part of a, a more, um, are th part of a commerce network too. So mm -hmm. they're managing money, they're handling money, they're buying things mm -hmm. which they have to use to supply their households as well as their shops. Um, and they're managing the money that's leaving the shop, paying the journeyman mm -hmm. or taking in those orders that come in. Yeah, absolutely. So and Jenny uh, yeah. filmed a, a lovely clip to illustrate just that. Yeah. Women are a part of the workplace in the 18th century, but not always with the tool in hand. Many appear in family businesses as managers. Women were handling money, keeping records, and were regular consumers in the larger market. When inheriting businesses from family, members, or husbands, women easily moved into the role as managers, as evident with Williamsburg widows like Elizabeth Dean, a coachmaker's wife, and Clementina Rind, Virginia Gazette editor and printer. So in that exchange, um, you saw one of our shoemakers coming in to purchase the coffee pot. So I recorded what was made um, mm -hmm. and who picked it up and the date of it and recorded it in the day book and then presented him with a receipt. And we see receipts for women in trades. Um, in the case of Elizabeth Bennett, who was a ironmonger or a blacksmith? Uh, she was a blacksmith. Yeah, there's um, when they're constructing Blenheim over in England in 1708. This is the ledger um, for the the building materials for that building project, um, and she's listed as providing a significant amount of iron work um, mm -hmm. for that. Um, and interestingly, there's other smiths that are being um, contracted with for iron work as well, so she's not the only one, but they're, you know, she's being listed, um, you know, her name rather than anybody else, so presumably she's the one doing the work, or at the very least owns the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is interesting with the all-encompassing aspect of, of women you know, practicing in trade is that it's it's not just the physical making of things, and it's also not just the uh, account book, you know, work and the what we would think of today like behind the business side of things. Right. They're they're covering all of it, which means they have to be educated, probably through either an informal apprenticeship or from their parents. So you got to know how to read. You got to know how to write in some way. You got to be able to to um, write with a clear hand, right? Because if you're ordering something from England.
you don't want that order to get over there and your agent go, what did they write? <laughs> um, and send you something that you're just not going to be able to use at all. So those skills, I mean, even like geography and understanding of political nature, mm -hmm. of you're trying to have something imported and there's, there's issues in politics that are happening in other places. I mean, we hear that in the revolution all the time. Absolutely. That supply is a huge, huge problem. Um, you know, the, the people that we interpret in my shop are relying constantly on leather imports that are just oftentimes not there. Right. So you have to be able to, to handle kind of all of that information. Yeah. Well, Ann Getty kind of falls into that as well. At one point, she has to petition the courts to get paid for a job her husband had done um, cleaning muskets for the magazine, and wow. he never got paid for it. So she had to petition twice to get that money. Through the county courts. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. she's she's advocating for her business. You gotta that. pay the bills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, so we've discussed a number of uh, different topics at this point, um, but I certainly uh, would love to know what y'all are curious about. What questions um, do you have that we can expand on for you? Thank you, Ashlyn. Uh, this is Brody Adams, the Trades Tuesday producer, and I will be giving voice to your questions today. Um, Lynn, you mentioned several times Mrs. Getty uh, and that she was actually pregnant while she was working and also had you know, seven other children uh, to be concerned with. Um, that obviously sounds very busy. So how would a woman in the 18th century be able to juggle all of these things, working, managing a shop, and also being a mother? Yeah, I think you know, out of necessity, you pull on what you've got around you. And there's, there's other children, other relatives. I mean, we've got grandparents and aunts, brothers and sisters, enslaved folks are going to be a major part of that household that's going to keep things running. And um, I think, really think that's the reason Ann Getty was able to kind of keep things moving until James Getty Jr. We see him kind of overseeing most of that. Hmm. So. Yeah, and I think that support structure is incredibly important to recognize because, mm -hmm. you know, that just not, not being able to, there are so many hours in a day, and that hasn't changed. So yeah. right. <laughs> you do have to have some capacity to, to multitask and do all of these things. Um, and just simply having other hands makes a big difference. Absolutely. I think that's also another big difference between when we look at trade shops and warehouses in England and other parts of Europe versus, like, say, Virginia, where in Virginia, a lot of those extra hands are enslaved labor, both male and female, who could potentially just be like taking care of the household aspects of things. Right. Maybe they're keeping the fires going and cooking and cleaning and managing you know, small children. Um, but it's also entirely possible that those enslaved individuals are actively part of the workforce within the mm -hmm. shop as well. Um, when we think of the case of, of Margaret Hunter, uh, who's a milliner here in the city, by the time she passes away, I think she has somewhere close to 10 enslaved individuals, both um, adults and children. And probably some of those individuals are basically running her household so she can focus on the business. But we do know that one of those enslaved women is a clear starcher by trade who is probably helping uh, in the millinery business and therefore is her labor is being used to support Margaret's um, business uh, work, but also the household itself. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in perhaps in England, you find that not necessarily being filled by enslaved individuals, but by servants and other family members. Right. Well, and Jenny has a, a great reference for uh, discussing <coughs> families and older folks taking care of oh, yeah. Um, yeah, children. Yeah, in um, 1775, Mary Lacey, who is a shipwright, is talking about her upbringing and how when both of her parents were out working, it was the elderly people in the community who would watch her. Mm -hmm. So you rely on the people who cannot work any longer to watch the children. And mm -hmm. if you have older children, you kind of give them that task yeah. of taking care of the younger children. Yeah. So it's definitely a group effort yes. <laughs> yeah. to make Take it all the work. <laughs> yeah. Well, and as you mentioned, Ashlyn, you know, oftentimes your, your business or your workspace is maybe not that far away from your house. It's not like your house is in one city and your, your right. business is yeah. the other city. The toddlers will find you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're very good at that. Yeah. Uh, so you have, to, you have to have those support networks because there's going to be stuff that you're doing that little, little thinkers can't get into. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ideally. <laughs> That's an awesome question, though. Yeah. What else can we discuss with you? All right. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions coming in, actually. Great. Um, 
One question from Cin uh, Cindy is, what is the difference between an apprentice, a journeyman, and a master? Oh, excellent. Should we, let the master Should we turn to our resident <laughs> master to, uh, to answer so, this question? So, uh, an apprentice is uh, usually, not always, but usually someone around the age of about 13, 14, and they're kind of like a student. And that apprenticeship can be, like we've said, can be a very formal signed contract in most cases, um, but it can be also quite informal as well. Usually that's about a seven year endeavor to become what then would be a journeyman. Now your journeyman is a day worker. The journeyman is carrying on the day to day work that's uh, being executed in those shops that you're getting paid for. And they are earning a wage for that. Uh, so as an apprentice, we know, you know, at that time, they're not getting paid. Um, so again, treating it like a student. Now a master, this is where things get a little more complicated. Um, masters in the 18th century were owners. You know, they did not necessarily mean that they were the most skilled person within that particular job or business. Um, they might just be the owner. And as long as they're hiring the right journeyman to carry out the right, you know, quality of work, they're going to be master of that particular business. So it's a, it's a little more complicated maybe. And today we see it, I think, a little more cut and dry. Well, I think that's an important point too, just to touch on is the ability, the eye to judge what is quality work. Exactly. Um, so these women who are running these shops, even if they're not physically doing the work in that case, they still have to know what that work needs to look like mm -hmm. um, and what's right. required to go out to the customer. Mm -hmm. and well, I think also how we treat our historic trades, apprentices, journeymen, and masters is, is different than the 18th century. Because yeah. uh, obviously Jenny and I are in our apprenticeships um, where we probably, hopefully, wouldn't still be in our yeah. apprenticeships in the 18th century. <laughs> um, so obviously how Colonial Williamsburg handles um, within the trades department is that we have apprentices who are actively learning. Um, not only the practice and preservation of the trade, but also the educational and research portions of it. Mm -hmm. um, so when Jenny and I talk about our apprenticeships, that's, that's kind of where we're focusing. Um, and then, you know, when you receive your journey papers as a journeyman, you are expected to be able to work independently, mm -hmm. actually very similar to what the 18th century does. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, eventually, um, you can apply for master, and my understanding is you have to prove that you have added to the mm -hmm. trade and are able to do that. Mm -hmm. And you basically, it's kind of like you have a petition, yeah. you have a portfolio, there's yeah. a lot to it. So it's a big deal yeah. today in the 21st century how we do it here in trades. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, as long as you know how to hire the right person in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And if we look at you know folks like Paul Revere, his mother. Um, they're pretty sure that, you know, Revere is not quite old enough to take over that business. So it may even have been for a very short time, hmm. but we know Revere's mother was carrying on that business until he was just old enough to take over. And she needed to know that quality and, you know, be able to judge that work to, you know, make sure she's, you know, getting paid for what she's given out there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you've yeah. talked some about sort of how we at Colonial Williamsburg now uh, use these different levels of tradespeople um, to signify, you know, experience and expertise. Um, but in the 18th century, are there any accounts that show someone who started as a, an apprentice later uh, purchasing or becoming the owner or the master of a, uh, a trade shop? That's a great question. Sure. Um, well, I know uh, the master of the blacksmith shop in the 18th century, James Anderson, um, He's apprentice, and then very shortly after um, is starting up his own business. So I think some of it depends on how quickly you can generate capital yeah. to invest in that business. Right. Because as Lynn mentioned, you're not paid a monetary wage. You're paid in kind. You're given your food, your clothing, right. your education. But you don't really have any money to invest in, at least for my trade, pretty substantial tooling, things like anvils mm -hmm. and vices, um, a masonry forge, a building to put it all in. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty costly. So in order to do that, you would more than likely need to work for somebody for potentially a number of years as a journeyman to be able to save up enough to do that. But and once you're done with your apprenticeship, there's not a, and a not barrier. And not all those apprentices are going to become journeymen. Yeah. Not all those apprentices are, or even those journeymen are going to become masters. Most of them right. will not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think safe to say in the 18th century, you will find a lot more people who are journeymen mm -hmm. um, and who never 
attain owning their own business. Mm -hmm. um, but the woman in, is it Charleston? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, Anne Maria Hoyland in 1751 inherits her mother's business. There you go. So there's that family tradition of passing it along. Um, yeah. And she is married, so it's not going to her husband. Right. It's not going to any other siblings within the family, but she is advertising in the South Carolina Gazette in 1751 that she is doing tin work and brazing, so working with brass, in the same location and same manner as her mother did. Yeah. And I, I just thought of something. We're, we're using the term journeyman a lot because that's what was used uh, in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't, unless it was a really female dominated trade like millinery or mantle making, oftentimes you don't find women being referred to as journey women uh, unless they're in one of those really, really, really defined female dominated trades. So when we use journeymen, we're referring to both men and women in 18th century skilled um, uh, labor. All right. Uh, question from Matt regarding um, sort of equality in the workplace in the 18th century. Uh, first of all, did men and women both receive equal respect as tradespeople? Um, and also, we know that today, uh, sort of a hotbed issue is pay discrepancy. Was there pay discrepancy in the 18th century the way that we've seen, you know, in the 20th and 21st century? This is a fascinating conversation. I will take it. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, oh, Emma knows. Uh, so the first part of that question receive the same level of respect. And I think I, I think we can say both yes and no to that, mm -hmm. that because it's gonna be situational. But you also find that there are some male tradesmen who have a terrible reputation because they are just not good at their trade. And the same thing with women. Um, so I think sometimes when the, the respect enters into it, it's are you good at what you're doing? Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily based on are you male or female within this trade, it's are you good at what you're doing? Um, a good example of this is Clementina Rind. When her husband passes away in 1773, he holds the contract of public printer, which is an elected position. And basically the House of Burgesses are like, yep, she's got it. We don't need to worry about this. And when the post comes up, they elect her. Um, so they saw them in that particular regard as equals in being able to accomplish this elected position. Uh, so I think you see that sort of thing happening. As far as pay goes, it's actually a really complicated answer. Because I think oftentimes the 18th century views labor in a very different way that we view it today. Um, that they viewed it in the 19th century, that they viewed it in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And really how you break down the categories in the 18th century is you have skilled labor, which is someone who has gone through you know, the teachings and the understandings through an apprenticeship and probably even has been working for a couple of years to understand their trade in and out, all of the complexities of it. They know what they're doing. You can put something in front of them and they're gonna make it and it is the skilled part of the trade. Mm -hmm. Then there's gonna be a category which I think we all could classify as half-skilled labor, where maybe you've been taught some aspects of a trade, or maybe you are a nail maker, and that is what you do. You make nails. You're not doing anything else, but you're making nails. So it's half-skilled uh, labor. And then there's a category in the 18th century that is unskilled labor. Uh, and I would put into that sewing is considered an unskilled labor. So if you have anyone who's just doing piecework of sewing, whether, for example, that is putting together the tops of shoes, um, someone else has cut out all the pieces, they give you a bundle, you're stitching those shoes together, that's technically unskilled labor. Sewing is, is a skill, it's a tool, it's not a, an art form in the 18th century. So you have those three categories, skilled, half-skilled, and unskilled, and usually you have prices that are then attached to it. So you might have a woman who is working in a skilled uh, part of that, that job, and she's getting paid one wage, and a man who's doing half-skilled labor or unskilled labor is being paid a different wage. Um, so it's a little bit, I think, more complicated because they might not actually be doing the same thing, and that's why they're getting paid different wages. Now you do find in some records that they are doing the same thing and um, women are being paid a different wage. Um, actually, Ashlyn, you brought this up earlier uh, about- Yeah, there's some um, 
um, breakdowns of agricultural workers' wages. Um, and it's a little hard to necessarily correlate that to trades because they have different situations. But yeah. one of the factors that they were commenting on was that in a lot of the um, the work days they were looking at, there was a, a shorter number of hours in the women's work day, excuse me, than in the, the men's work day. Mm -hmm. And so the men were being paid more for a day's work than the women, but they were working different numbers of hours. Yeah. Um, and what the reasons for that are, you know, wasn't entirely clear, but part of it could just simply be what we've been talking about, that need to stop and go make food, care for children, do yeah. other tasks, mm -hmm. um, which is then going to cut into their monetary yeah. pay yeah. for that day. Well, and going back to the question about equality of men's work and women's work and how that compares, um, I think we have the image of the Tinker's runaway ad. So there's this pair of Tinkers, their husband and wife, they run away in 1767 up around Tappahannock. And there's a really interesting line in here where it says, uh, William and Hannah Daly's are both Tinkers by trade, of which she is excellent at the work. Now, there's been some debate in my shop over what this means. I think it's a great indication that she is actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. Whether it's good work or bad work, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there's been some discussion that perhaps that, that one little word, that she is excellent at the work, is a slight to her husband. So perhaps the person mm -hmm. putting the advertisement in the paper is using that as a jab at her husband, like your wife does the work better than you. Right. It could be that they both stink at their job. <laughs> They're terrible tinkers, but he's like, hey, your wife does a better job than you do. <laughs> so that's, it's up for debate right now, but it is one of those things that I think it's a good indication that she's doing the work. And as a note, too, tinkers versus tinsmiths are a little bit different because um, tinkers are doing repair work. Uh, tinsmiths are making the work new. And I think what also enters into this conversation um, is what is the idea of women's work and men's work in the 18th century. And those are very fluid. Um, it, we don't have set, like what happens in the 19th century, um, very different gendered roles. There are things that women naturally fall into in the 18th century and things that men seem to fall into. But those crossovers happen a lot. Because basically, we're living in a world that everything is done by hand. And if you have a skilled pair of hands, mm -hmm. great. Um, so part of that is practical. Part of it is also so, uh, social thought that kind of enters into that change in the 19th century. Um, I think all of us will agree it is by no means a golden age. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but depending on which way you look at it, um, there, there is respect. And there is, in some cases, um, equal pay for women who are practicing trades. And all sometimes even greater pay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, all about quality. That was a great question. Thank you, great answers. Um, another question we have from Paul. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you as modern practitioners contend with in the 18th century environment? And is the public understanding of the role of women in the 18th century, or do you find there are a lot of misconceptions? Hmm. A lot of misconceptions. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we do yeah. very often find people viewing our, our work through the lens um, of the 19th and 20th mm -hmm. century, which, you know, is what's more recent to our, you know, understanding of, of life, so it, it makes sense. But the 18th century very much is its own thing, um, and people were dealing with life in a, a very different way. And for us today, it's a challenge. It's a great challenge to, to be able to shed light on that and to be able to you know, open those doors and say, well, let's take a look at what you know, mothers, daughters, you know, all of these women that are working in these trades, you know, what is their role? Is it? And for us, you know, it can be challenging, but it also can be incredibly rewarding to be able to shed that light. Mm -hmm. Well, I think often you know, there's an assumption that, well, women are only here in, in our modern-day department because of modern workplace <laughs> requirements. <laughs> yep. um, but in reality, they were there historically. So right. you know, what we're looking at and what we're doing is, is what they would have been doing at the time in many cases. So. Yeah, there's a huge diversity of the workforce, mm -hmm. both in England and, and here in the colonies. Mm -hmm. Um, and really, I think, you know, at least for me, and I assume for you guys, it's, it's an honor to be able to bring those stories forward mm -hmm. because it's, it is something that's quite difficult to research. It's hard to find that yeah. information because it's so normal or it's just not, um, not recorded or those records don't survive. Um, and so it's a real process to try and um, peel history apart and find, <laughs> find out what's going on. Right, absolutely. Especially with some of these trades that are, 
male dominated trades because yeah, then they're usually a sort of a, a, a physical misconception and you know I think then we can kind of start separating those skill levels of saying you know you know where do those skills lie and you know can we do this today and obviously mm -hmm. we're you know four women working in four pretty male dominated trades mm -hmm. so yeah and the, the other half of that question was really interesting, talking about how we as, as um, people today are, are, I think, some of the challenges in mm -hmm. the, the trade shop. I would say, first and foremost, we do not have the massive amount of backup that they would have had in the 18th century. Uh, what I mean by that is there are some things that I have to do in my trade that I could have just gone to the store and bought, but that trade doesn't exist anymore. Um, so, you know, I can't just go to the store and buy leather that's dressed in a specific way because nobody dresses leather like that anymore. So that's something that we end up having to do, which we never would have done in the 18th century, you know? Um, I think about the, the tailors who are oftentimes like wrapping thread buttons and yeah, did tailors do that yeah but they also could have gone and just bought them yeah. so I think that's something I miss <laughs> I yeah. miss the the amount of trades that just don't exist anymore mm -hmm. um, but then it also provides its own challenge mm -hmm. um, yeah. of having to do that so that's something I miss as a modern uh, person in the 18th century world <laughs> <laughs> anything else yeah, I think mm -hmm. I right. agree with that. we have a couple questions from Miss Raider's class the first one being um, what if you didn't know how to read and write? You've addressed a lot of the importance of that, but I'm sure there may have been some who were working in trades that may not have had those skills. Yeah. Well, you're, you're learning as much as you need for that particular yeah. trade. Mm -hmm. So in some trades, it's going to be a very dominant part of it. Um, and in certainly some trades um, where it's maybe less important. I know with Engravers, uh, silversmiths, jewelers, there's a lot of mathematics that's going into mm -hmm. it, a lot of science that's going into it, but definitely that reading and writing is you know, imperative, especially as an engraver. I mean, lettering is a huge part of, of the work itself. Um, so again, it's, it's trade specific. So some trades are gonna be very strong and then some trades, you know, not so much, be a lot weaker. Yeah, yeah. and that's I think, important. you know, when we say reading and writing, you know, it does sort of elicit thoughts of sort of this, this broad competency of, you know, what we today would consider, okay, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna read a novel after work kind of thing, but, right. you know, yeah. that's not necessarily what you have to be taught to keep a good ledger. You know, you have to know a very specific set of skills for that, yeah. and that's what you're taught. But beyond that, you know, may or may not. Yeah. Well, and you also don't see children leaving for the day to go off to school in the right. 18th century. Right. You don't have a schoolhouse in town. You don't have a, um, a large public education system. And that's where apprenticeships do step in. So you have the masters and mistresses teaching these children through the apprenticeship those basics of reading, writing, basic math sometimes, just mm -hmm. so that they have those skills later as adults. Yeah, and it's a great way, of, you know, perhaps you come from a farming background and maybe your parents aren't lettered and you're going into an apprenticeship and that's a step up in the world to learn those skill sets um, right. and to become more broadly capable of expanding you know, your business prospects. So you know, that could certainly be used as a social you know, ladder too for, for certain people. Great, thank you. Emma, you mentioned earlier that uh, there's a record of an apprenticeship at the age of three. I believe you said that that was likely a case of uh, sort of fostering a child. Mm -hmm. So this ties into Ms. Raider's class's other question um, what age did girls usually start an apprenticeship in the 18th century? So I think the, the best way to answer this is a really educated guess because as we've mentioned, a lot of these records don't really survive. Um, so the idea of putting kids into apprenticeships essentially as fostering, I mean, as we said, we have kids from a very young age, they probably would start actively learning a trade when they are ready to which is probably going to be for girls somewhere between, what, 10 and 12, I think is usually yeah. when we see women starting their apprenticeships. They tend to wrap up those apprenticeships around age 18. Again, apprenticeships are very fluid, so they're probably not going to last longer than seven years, but they could last shorter than that. So you see that as well. Um, oftentimes, you have to take into account what trade you're apprenticing in, because if you're going to be a blacksmith, uh, you might need a little bit more upper body strength before you start that work. Right. right. So you see, you know, very often a little bit older 
for blacksmithing, you know, 13 or 14, so you're physically, you know, much bigger and taller and able to, to build muscle, mm -hmm. you know, at that age. Um, and, you know, hopefully also able to bring a, a significant amount of focus to bear on your work <laughs> yeah. um, and, and learn effectively. Well, and we should probably mention, too, that that apprenticeship for the three-year-old is to a weaver yes. out in Stanton. So in the weaving trade, there are little things that you can teach small children to do, mm -hmm. even if it's just picking up scraps under the loom or mm -hmm. teaching them how to tie a knot eventually. Um, so it's little skilled things that they eventually build on to become a weaver later on. Yeah. And out in Stanton, too, in the western parts of Virginia, you see a lot more women participating in the weaving trade, yeah. which is predominantly a male trade in the 18th century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And children pay attention to what's around them. So mm -hmm. if they're constantly yes. surrounded by trade work and, and things like that, they're going to be watching, even mm -hmm. if they're not physically doing it quite yet. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, we'll they're say attention. a lot of those extremely young situations are usually the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a church or a charitable organization that's putting, basically providing for children that are orphaned which of course in the 18th century basically means the father's not in the picture for whatever reason. So they're just securing a future for very young ones, but hoping for the best once they get to that age. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tina here, wondering about um, modern day apprenticeships. How and where do you do your research for those apprenticeships? We have a great resource here called the Rockefeller Library. <laughs> um, so a lot of our research goes through our resources right here at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, but today, we also have a lot more access to the internet. Um, so we go and search other databases. Um, we're constantly looking for references in newspaper databases, um, archives like Fold3, which is a lot of military pensions mm -hmm. and information about military service, which might mention uh, information prior to enlistment. Um, where else do we look? Yeah, I Everywhere. mean, <laughs> the, the journeyman and the masters in your own shop um, is mm -hmm. oftentimes where a lot of this knowledge is being imparted as well. So we follow that practice in our modern uh, apprenticeships mm -hmm. as well. So my journeyman in my shop will be like, all right, we're learning about this today, and we'll be able to sit and talk about not just the active trades part, but also the research that they have done over their combined 40-something yeah. years of, of knowledge. So that's a great resource to have yeah. uh, essentially <laughs> mentors who are helping <laughs> yeah. us actively. Um, and then uh, it's the practicing as well. So it's a lot of... of um, hands-on, but Jenny said, the more people digitize records, the more yeah. we have access to. Yeah, so there's been amazing some, resource. There's yeah. been some amazing advancements in even the last decade of things that, you know, we never would have had access to. You know, books um, that are being published on Echo, which is the 18th century collections online, where you can go in and look for books that mention tinsmithing or mention engraving mm -hmm. or talk about, you know, military supply, things of that nature. All right. We have a question from Trish here. Uh, so on our panel, we have a blacksmith, a tinsmith, a leather worker artificer. Is that correct? Yeah, you okay. got it. <laughs> um, and we have an engraver. Mm -hmm. But what were some of the lesser known traits that women would have been a part of in the 18th century? Oh, boy. That's um, a long list. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge list. Um, I mean, there's so many trades that, you know, yeah. a lot of them, I think, like you mentioned earlier, are, are those really specific trades that are yeah. making a thing. Um, I think just earlier, Lynn was showing us an engraving of women who were making faux pearls. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, mm -hmm. it's... Fan making. And, uh, we know of a hand, just a handful of women making files specifically, mm -hmm. um, just file work. Um, pin makers oftentimes pin makers. Are, are women and children. Mm -hmm. uh, needle makers are oftentimes women and children. Mm -hmm. um, embroidery, which is a trade in and of itself, is often a female-dominated trade. Um, gosh. Um, you we see cutlers in Sheffield yeah. uh, making things like pen knives, um, scalpels, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So some middle-working trades, but um, yeah. more, more focused. There's actually a pretty large network in um, America, both as colonies and newly minted states, of women being involved in printing. Uh, in all aspects as well. So that's, I think, sometimes a trade that we don't necessarily think of women in, um, but they were active in that, uh, at least on this side of the ocean. 
Um, mm -hmm. There's some instances of women who inherit shops but continue to advertise that they're doing the work that their husbands did. And there's a great case of a woman named Elizabeth Weed up in Philadelphia who, in, who takes over her husband's shop and even says in the advertisement that she's doing the recipes that her husband taught her. That's cool. Sounds like Mrs. Dean. Yeah. 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 Just like Elkana Elizabeth. Dean in Williamsburg does coach making and uh, his wife will take over Elizabeth, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, you have mantua making and millinery, um, and then, you know, the, the off-spurt trades that, that go into to that as mm -hmm. well. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot. It's a huge number. There's yeah. a lot. Mm -hmm. And probably some that we don't even know about, right, because nobody thought of it to write it down. Well, and as you mentioned, those support trades, almost every trade has a whole bevy of their support trades and then their support trades, mm -hmm. and so it's just this giant um, sort of branching tree of trades that are all really working together to, to make those final products that you see on the shelf. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. All right, great. We have time for one last question. What can we do to better tell the story of women uh, in the trades? Well, I think in part just, you know, come to, you know, the study of this work with an open mind to look at, you know, what was there. You know, a lot of these you know, are stories that are hard to find, but you know, eventually, you know, they start to sort of spring to the surface you know, the more you, you dig into the work. Yeah, I think, too, not being afraid to ask questions. Oh, absolutely. Especially when approaching us in our jobs, um, because we do get a lot of people who come in with an assumption. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes that we should not be there or a question why we're there. Um, and it's okay to ask that. Yeah. We get it all the time, but at the same time, keep in mind you come in with a different approach as a modern person, too. Yeah. yeah, I think we have to remember that the 18th century might have looked at it one way, the 21st century looks at it a, a different way. Um, but being, yeah, open to the fact that there's a lot of things. I think also the other thing is that there's constantly new research that is coming to light. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, we just mentioned documents being digitized that we've never had access to before. And that's constantly changing our view of not only trades, but also women in trade. It's challenging where we thought that there were lots of women, but it turns out they may not be there, but they're in a different place. Mm -hmm. So there's always gonna be new research. So um, asking questions is great because you might have come to Colonial Williamsburg and asked a question, and the last time you did, there wasn't a great answer, but there may be this time around. Um, yeah, because very so, often your questions will spark questions for us, and we'll yeah. go off on, yeah. a, on a research tangent <laughs> well, to try and find out that it information. So, yeah. so it's a, a great interplay of, of information there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah. be open to that new research that is, is constantly being um, debated and discussed. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Um, and visit museums. Mm -hmm. Come visit museums. Look, come yeah. see us and talk to us, because uh, that's, you know, that's what we want to do is open, the, open those doors. Yeah. All right, thank you. Today's live stream was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. As always, this program was made possible through the generosity of our donors. Thank you. To learn how you can contribute, please follow the linked pins in the comments below, or join us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Ashlyn, Jenny, Emma, Lynn, thank you so much for being a part of this panel today uh, and presenting all of this wonderful and fascinating information to mm -hmm. us about women and the traits in the 18th century. Do you all have any final closing comments you would like to share? Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We love being able to discuss these subjects and we certainly uh, would love to see you in person. So please come visit us here at Colonial Williamsburg. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest of Women's History Month. Absolutely. <laughs>